everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for February 22nd, 2018. I'm your host, Scott Alden, also known as Aldi on Board Game Geek and Twitter. I'm once again joined by my co-hosts, Debbie Eric Martin and Lincoln Dammers. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey, Scott and Eric. Let's start off this week again by everybody's favorite segment, What Have You Been Playing? I know there's a game that both you and Eric have been super excited about called The Mind. Eric, why don't you describe it for us, and Lincoln, you can talk about it. Well, Lincoln and I went to the Spiel vor ein Messe trade show in Nuremberg, Germany. We recorded some number of videos. I don't know, Lincoln's in charge of that, so I'll let him do it. But we recorded overviews of lots of things. The thing that stood out for us was The Mind, a game by game by Wolfgang Warsch, published by NSV, Nuremberger Spielkarten Verlag. This is a game for two to four players. It's cooperative and you are trying to play cards in ascending order. And so it sounds very much like the game, which is also published by NSV. The difference is, is you're going to play in rounds and in each round you get as many cards as the number of rounds you're in. So it goes levels one to eight with four players. And you're going to pick up your cards and you're going to try to play all your cards in ascending order but you cannot communicate anything about what's in your hand. That's it. You just must play the cards at the right time. You know, to signal you're ready, you put your hand on the table. It's like this real performance piece. And you lift your hand up that we're all set to go. And then we just stare at each other. And when you feel the time is right, you play the card. And if there's, if no one else has a card that's below that, well, then you keep going. And you keep going and hopefully you play everything in order you win the level then you go to the next level now you have one more card in your hand each and you'll do it again and you'll do it again and if if you play something out of order i play a 50 and you had a 45 in your hand oh we lose a life and we keep going and you get lives equal to the number of players you have a special shuriken card that you can propose to use you just raise your hand and if everyone else raises their hand you use the shuriken and everyone discards the lowest card in their hand face up see what people have and then you continue and it's like this weird play where you know your lines but you don't know anyone else's lines and you don't really you, you just hope to perform at the right place at the right time and do what's expected of you without really knowing what people expect it's a it's a crazy thing because the game is very tense and it's very similar to that but it has this sort of ongoing tension as you as you get pressured with cards and, and you know what's going to happen here and i find the mind has this more this, this ebb and flow we played uh with lincoln and friends in germany and i've played just two player games and three players i've played more than 20 times since the show uh i've won twice with two players all the way through level 12 with my wife who who we played a ton of the game with so i think we're just like we're there like we, yes, we, we have become one. And that, that's the way they talk about it in the rules is you were supposed to synchronize with the group and you just sort of come together. Oh, did I play too early or did you play too late? I know we must, we must join together and do this. And it's weird. So you've got this little tension, you're, you're just staring, you're staring. And then magically it'll be like, I play a 22 and then you drop your 23 right on top of it. Like somehow you just knew it doesn't always work. And sometimes you, Oh man, it is, but it's, it's just like this weird magic and like you just start laughing as you're staring at one another. It's weird. It's like this performance art piece that you're participating in. And I spoke a little bit with the editor at NSV, Reinhard Stelp. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth and he said it, it was like the only game that he pretty much applauded when he read the rules. Like he was just, he was like, this is magic. He just knew it from reading the rules. And it's just, that's how it feels. And I've played with people who are not engaged. Like they get their cards and they sort of slump back in the table and they're just, uh, but no, you have to like, you know, be with it and sort of with people. I don't know. It's a very weird experience. Maybe you talk about, about that and carry on with what you played. We actually played it uh, this weekend with uh, Dave and Rusty. And we didn't actually have the game, so we just, uh, the mind, uh, we used the game as a, just to, we just guessed at what the level bonuses were. Yeah. And um, it's kind of a weird, almost rhythm uh, timing thing that you have to have. Rusty 
just could not get it. He would, he'd sit there and agonize over something. And so, you, you know, you can't say anything. You're just sitting there looking at each other and you put your hand on the table to like draw, to join minds. And then you'd wait for him and wait for him and finally go, hey, I'm gonna play this set. You know, you play this card at seven ahead. And he's like, oh, I had a card that was three ahead. And I'm like, <laughs> that's basically an automatic. The only number you have to worry about is the number just before yours. Right. Because the one that's just be before that is gonna be an automatic play. Yes. So it's like, he just kept doing it and he constantly had a three. It was unbelievable. I'm like, Rusty, are you rhythmically challenged or something? Because it was pretty great. That's right. Um, but it's really fun. We actually had a great time and Nikki, uh, so, you know, it took her a little bit to grasp it, and Dave was like on board. So we've got a copy, and we're going to probably do an episode once we return from uh, Can. Yeah. But man, is that a great game? You have to. You have to do. I know you talked about maybe having pocket cam. You can see what someone has. Yeah. And so you get to be that person. It's it's weird. It's just such a weird experience. The excitement when you do play se sequential ones. You sit there and you look at the uh, your partner or the other player, and you go. Boom, boom, and it's like, we did that when we were in Nuremberg with Annie and Sebastian, and we just flipped out. It was so spectacular yes. that we would have that timing. You just don't know how you even get it. It's really great. Yeah, and you know, oh, yes. As you mentioned, you sort of, you get that, yes, the next, if you have the next number, automatically you slap it down. Everyone has to be paying attention and focus. And if you have the one, two away, it's like this slight pause. And yes, yes you sort of get this thing, and the rules specify don't count. Right, you're not counting and in, in, in trying to sync your counting and mine and play everything rhythmically at the you know like a metronome. It's just the feeling of the group all coming together. So that's it's amazing. Yeah. I had a lot quite entertaining time watching Lincoln and Nikki and Rusty and Dave play through. I, they were just fooling around, and I was just watching over webcam. But some of the it's the agonizing like putting your, you know, you're almost going to play your card or I'm not going to hold it, like, that I don't want to go too early or too late. It's kind of fun. I can't wait to try it. Tom Felber came up to Eric and I at Nuremberg and he's like, you've got to see this game. And I'm, and I said, I, he starts to pull on, I'm like, oh, we saw it already. It's amazing. Like, it was so exciting to see him excited about a game because he's so even. <laughs> it was just spectacular. I don't think I've ever seen him excited about a game before. And like the way you describe it, it's quite... He did. He could, he's like, oh, you have to check out this game. And he drops the bag on the ground, starts pulling the game out. It was so great. So now the question is, will it be nominated for Spiel des Jahres or will it, because it's so much like the game. But it's it's not. But it's different. Like the, yeah. The, so. the rough description of it is like the, the game. And I've had other people say, oh, yeah, it's just like the game. I played with this eight-year-old and he was like, oh, it's just like the game, isn't it? And it was just like. <laughs> and no, it's not. <laughs> but But it's, I don't know. It, it, it feels different as you do more. It's amazing. I could definitely see the mind getting nominated for Spiel des Jahres just because it provokes a different feeling in the players. You can explain this game in a minute. I had a new person yesterday who come by and never met this woman before. She's like a friend of a friend who came by and we played and it was just, it was great. Just having this interaction, this silent sort of staring, like are you, are you doing this? Are you doing this? I don't know this person, but we're meeting silently over the table and sort of figuring things out. I don't know. It's a, it's a very different interaction and it worked for every age range. It's a small price point. You can definitely see, see it being nominated. So. Well, you want to go out on a limb and say it's going to be a finalist? I would say it's a final. I mean, I thought before Azul was a Sherlock for nomination and i can see the mind up there as well and lincoln and i kept looking to nurberg what are, what's what are people showing that might be nominated and it's hard of course because you get a four minute description and you're not playing it right. you don't really get the feel for it so you're just going by i don't know essence or some mystical whatever but i mean this oh man actually you having it in action and just I don't know. I don't know what else would be nominated. What else would be a finalist? That was my excitement about about Nuremberg was like what I would get to see that the nominees are because so many games come out from that uh, f show that get nominated. And I mean, we didn't see everything, of course, and we certainly didn't see anything in depth. But uh, the but the mind certainly sticks uh, sticks out. It's very, very different and special. Oh, did you did you explore the advanced variant of the mind yet? 
Did you know about that? Is that the one where it's face down? You don't even, you just, you just do the cards without looking at them? Yes, I chatted with the designer a little and he said, once you get past level, you know, eight, 10 or 12, depending on the number of players, then you have to start again from level one where you play the cards face down and you reveal them only at the end of the round to see whether you did it or not. That is the advanced, that's the advanced variant. So you can really see if you have become one. Oh, that's amazing. Lincoln, did you have any other games you were playing recently? Eric, Annie, Sebastian, and I played their brand new copy of the game, which they'd never played. They bought it at a flea market. They also got um, Blueprints, the Z-Man game, for eight euros sealed, which is such a deal. Eric looked it up, and he's like, wow, this is worth a lot of money right now. Um, but they really loved it. They were At first, they're like, is this a game? And then they really got into it. Um, it was pretty great. And we also played The Banishing, which uh, with Dave and Rusty, Nikki and I, and that's, that game's spectacular. It's such a cool uh, game that has a really fun, cooperative uh, element that you're dealing with these invading undead or whatever. I can't remember exactly what they're supposed to be, but it's so good. So you've got two fabulous card games you guys have played. Uh, Eric, I know you played another board game that uh, you were pretty excited about. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, there's actually a few. I'll just I'll run through them in a minute. Uh, Sakura by Reiner Knizia, published by Osprey. It's a game where you want to be close to the Emperor, but not too close. You're trying to push other people into him or the Emperor back. You know, it's a very simple, simultaneous card game. Uh, Tic Tac Moo, it's a two player only game where you are trying to collect animals or fill one of your barnyards. And you have some restrictions on where you can place animals in the grid and different things like this. This is a 30 second introduction of everything. Princess Jing, a two player game by Roberta Fraga that is be debuting at the con fair. Uh, was his, I believe, first game ever designed more than 18 years ago and it's finally being published. And the production is just gonzo. It is way over the top, hidden movement game, very simple. It's kind of a weird combination. Uh, Otis by Claude Lucini, published by Pearl Games. This is like the, the, oh man, there, there's so many things that are densely intertwined together where you are scuba diving and trying to collect resources at five different levels on your board. And you're gonna be taking actions at five levels that correspond to bonuses at five levels for divers at five levels to collect the resources there where there are also special powers and then the divers have to surface and the action goes away the diver surfaces and the other ones sink down. And so you're managing this incredible logistic chain, which is just mind boggling. And you're just, man, that hamster cage was, was, was going a mile a minute there. <laughs> it was, it was crazy trying to figure out how this all works. And this is all just like, you were just looking at your stuff. You're not paying attention to anyone else because there's so much you're trying to figure out initially on the first play. So we'll see on the second play. What'd you play Scott? This weekend, I had a Kickstarter weekend, uh, as you could say. I played all Kickstarter games. The first was uh, Victory Point Games just came out with a deluxe version of Massive Darkness um, with optional miniatures, and I put uh, that on the table, and we played through it, and uh, we initially thought we were going to lose horribly. It's a co-op game where you're trying to defeat the Necromancer, um, and we did in the last hour of the game, like maybe like the last, like, you know, one more stroke of the game and it would have killed us. So it's quite satisfying. Uh, if you like co-op games with a horror theme, that one, horror and fantasy, and they've, I think they've had four expansions to date for the original printing, the first version. This is all thrown into one box and I hadn't seen it all in one place. So check that out. Massive Darkness, second edition. Also played the King Daddy of Kickstarter games uh, from Seabon. Rising Sun from Eric Lang, and that was quite a game. First of all, I want to say the miniatures were phenomenal. Like, I can't even think of any better that I've seen in a game. Just, I mean, Blood Rage is pretty close, but these blow Blood Rage out of the water. Like, they're just, your jaw just drops looking at some of the stuff. They were kind of remarkable when they first started showing them. I think at Gen Con, was it more than a year ago? Maybe two years ago? Man, they were... It was mind blowing. It was. Yeah, they looked uh, unbelievable. The game is gorgeous. The artwork is my favorite kind of that watercolor Japanese style artwork. The, the kanji characters and I think it's kanji. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of a, a dummy with that stuff. But the game for me is not my kind of game. I really enjoyed playing it and I will probably play it again. But it is a combat game. It is heavy, heavy conflict. And you are fighting battles to win honor. 
Um, and it's got one of the most unique kind of um, um, battle mechanisms I've ever seen in a game. There's a there's you, where you blind bid to wage war. So there's four stages of war. Um, and in fact, one of the stages is where you can commit seppuku and all your guys just die. So there's that part of the game. And then you go into a combat phase where you're fighting against Ronin. And then you can take hostages of the other, uh, you know, um, your enemies. Uh, and then you can have poets write stories about the battle and you can gain honor that way too. So it's got a very cool, I've like, I've never seen it before and it's super intriguing and I'm super bad at it. Um, <laughs> and I'm terrible at negotiation and, and it's got one of those, and since it's blind bidding, it's got one of those double think where I, I think that you think and I, that you think and I think back and forth and, and there's, there's alliances too, right? You can make a line. Yes. That is another cool part of the game. This, this game has a lot of cool things. You can make an alliance at the beginning. It's called the tea ceremony where you ally with another player and you can break that alliance during the year, but you, it, at, at great cost, right? Your, your alliances give you huge bonuses during the, during the actual like game part of the, before the war kind of game. So you and your ally will gain bonuses based on the actions you choose. And it's got a very unique action selection mechanism too. Check it out if you like heavy conflict combined with a little bit of Euro and blind bidding and fighting and gigantic monsters. <laughs> They're just ridiculous. Um, there's Rising Sun monsters. in a nutshell. So let's move on to the news. Eric, I know there was big news this week with another acquisition from Asmodee. Actually, two acquisitions. Why don't you tell us about those? Yes. Right before the... Uh, Spiel Verein Mess Affair, Asmini issued a press release. They had bought Polish publisher and distributor Rebel and rushed that news out. Uh, at the fair, we learned that they had also purchased Lookout, but that was not public for another week. And Asmini bought Lookout games. They also bought Mayfair, but Mayfair seems like it's pretty much going away. Mayfair, all the assets are going to be acquired by Asmini and they will reuse them as they wish. They can keep the Mayfair brand or not. It's totally up to them. Uh, Lookout has now reprinted tons of games that were not available in the US from Spiel 2017 and earlier like Baron Park, which had gone out of print and other titles. And now those are going to be shipped over to North America now and out sometime in the near future. The Far Agricola Farmers of the Morgue uh, reprint for the new uh, second edition of Agricola is on the way. All sorts of stuff coming out here. And it seems mostly the holdup was just funds to print everything and distribute it. So. Now it's being taken care of. Um, also coming to the U.S., uh, Mego Games has Yay! has launched its U.S. division. It's been in the business for 30 years, and previously other publishers had distributed and licensed Amigo titles like Rio Grande with Bonanza and Mayfair with lots of things. Well, December 2017, Amigo incorporated itself in the U.S. because uh, they knew uh, they had talked with Mayfair. Everything had been handed back. They bought all of Mayfair's stock of Amigo titles. They're going to be selling off that and then entering the market on its own uh, with 20 titles in 2018, many of them freshly redesigned for the U.S. market because they think that the market needs a different look than what they use in Germany. So The, art, the cover art looks great. I, I, hope, I hope they're redoing the games themselves too. The catalog that the representative shared with me said all artwork preliminary, nothing is final. And that's mostly because they would have the new cover of no thanks, but then the card artwork was Shona Shaisa. So, you know, that was just to get that catalog out for Toy Fair. I guess they had to print that up without having the vision images of the cards ready. So we'll see, Huh? we'll see how that looks. Interesting. Yeah. Or, you know, Things get things happen in transit. They may have versions at Toy Fair to show. I'll see tomorrow when I'm in New York. A lot of neat Saul Bass looking stuff on those new uh, covers or 50s, 60s stuff. Yeah, it's very 50s, 60s stuff. Of course, uh, Toy Fair was five days ago. If you're watching this, the day the video is published, so I remember that. And we will actually be in Con covering that event at this moment, maybe. I just wanted to go back to comment on the Mayfair closing down. That's kind of a sad thing for me because the Mayfair version of Settlers of Catan and the brown box with the kind of photographic photorealistic artwork on it was the first kind of real Euro game I ever played, at least what we call Euro games. So adios Mayfair, sorry to see you go, but know that you changed my life and I'm sure you changed 
a lot of people's lives by bringing all these great games to America. Yeah. I've seen comments that are like, oh, well, what has Mayfair done recently? But it's like they cultivated Catan for 20 years. They created the industry that basically gave us all of this. Yeah, it's it's huge. Well, Jay was there back then, too. Jay Tummelson was responsible for, right now the, the owner of Rio Grande Games, Jay Tummelson, was responsible for all of almost all of the imports, that first run of imports that came in from uh, Germany. And then beyond that, they did a lot more, and we'll see what survives out of that. Yeah, I think uh, there's quite a few titles Mayfair had kind of made on their own that were are definitely like evergreens and should be around for a print. Uh, anything else? I have a quick news item about a very prolific YouTuber that lives in Malta named Richard Ham, also known as Rado. I know a lot of people know him and his uh, frenetic overview videos. Rado runs through. He is moving to the United States, which. Unfortunate circumstances is take going to take care of his mother um, for her health reasons. But I think that him being in the United States is an exciting thing for a lot of people um, where he can sort of be on the schedule of Americans and then also potentially go to more conventions and who knows what can happen. Uh, I heard a rumor that he may stop his videos for a little while, but I, and I hopefully they will be picked back up um, shortly because I know you can't take the game out of Rado think he's hooked just like all of us so interesting news there if you want a lame segue uh lincoln maybe you talk about you coming to the u.s from your first experience in nuremberg at the spiel var and Mesa show you hadn't been there before what was it like <laughs> it was great it's a totally different i mean i've been to new york toy fair and it's definitely similar in feel but nuremberg is massive um the Eric and I basically only saw, I think, four halls. Basically, not even maybe that. Ten, ten up and down and four maybe I think we saw and maybe another one. Uh, and I would look as we were walking to other halls, but it's insane. There's so much stuff there. And we were nonstop. I was so sore from just standing and walking the whole day where we basically had maybe a 15 or 20 minute break in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and if we were lucky, another five or 10 minutes somewhere else, but that was rare. Uh, because uh, people would come up to us and ask us to film, and if we had time, we would do it. But we also must have missed many publishers. There's just so much, because it's basically who gets back to us and anything Eric kind of pushes. And we did go to see Jumbo, which was exciting, because they're doing gamer games again, which was very, very cool. They did um, Merchants of Amsterdam in the day and Tycoon, uh, so that was exciting. And then... There are publishers we didn't visit, but... Sometimes I, I don't even know what's there. And really, we could potentially stay a fourth day and explore more. There's Polish publisher Truffle, and then there's Clementoni, and then there's ATM Kenzel, and there's, there's other people that, that sort of hit this mainstream market that sometimes have gamer stuff, which is more towards the BGG audience, but sometimes just mainstream, and we just run. We just run because we're yes. already booked. It's exciting because we meet all kinds of great people. The first day, we're on the train to the convention center, and uh, we meet Forrest and Prusan guys. What were their names, Eric? Uh, Andy Forrest and Alan Prusan. And those guys are so interesting. They were talking about the Jurassic Park game that you had just mentioned, which they... That was actually the subject of a lot of things at the fair uh, that they just that was just announced that Eric had had no embargo on, but then turns out that it shouldn't have been released. Um, yeah. But those guys have a really really neat story. We should actually talk to them at some point. Uh, I spoke with them on the train, and then we were at the Asthma Day event, and they both sat at our table again, and I was just asking them question after question after question. They're just so interesting because they've been doing it for about 18 years and have a really really interesting story. That was the other thing. We'd go around and we'd see these games by Prospero Hall, and you're like, oh, that's Forrest Buzan. And then I just kept seeing their name at all these different publishers. It was unbelievable. <laughs> because they have, a forget, 35 people? Something around that. They, they have a, yeah, it's a team. It's, it's a big team. It's a big team that all works together. They're all sort of collectively done with a lot of back and forth. And so, yes, you get a lot of games designed that way. I really want to know about their process. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. All right, well, we take a trip to the West Coast. You're already, yes. you're already on the West Coast. That, that means nothing to you. I got to take a trip north. So what's the biggest difference between this convention and others? You mentioned how it's similar to Toy Fair. I don't know if that ties into it. Well, the, the one thing that was most uh, no noticeable was the ability to get around the fair almost without fail quickly because there's nobody there. 
it seems like nobody's in the booths, but there are people in all the booths that are talking everywhere. There's people buying, you know, the publishers are showing the new games and it was amazing. So it's, there's clearly a lot of people there, but it's mostly uh, the publishers and the distributors, I guess. And obviously there's designers and people like that having meetings, but we didn't see any, you know, we don't really see any of that. We just see what's going on in the one booth that we're at. Uh, and some of the booths are just tiny. It's all in passing. Like I saw Roberta Fraga a couple times and you're just like, oh, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah, we, we saw Wolfgang Kramer. Wolfgang Kramer in the Ankama booth, which was weird. Absolutely. I don't know. It's just, it's a weird fair because there's a lot of business going on and yet it seems very quiet. Unless you're editing the audio. <laughs> Unless you're editing the audio, in which case, yes, that is still surprisingly noisy. I, I, I imagine it as it's, a quiet fair. It's a big open space. It is not as loud as Essen, of course, but it's a big open space. Yeah. So there's a lot of reverberating voices. And like in our video, our uh, summary video that we did from Nuremberg, there was that really loud something in the background that distracted us at one point. We're like, what is going on? But, you know, there's a little bit of... Uh, Hucksterism going on, showing you stuff, and you know it was it was odd, but it was a great it was a great a great event and a lot to be learned there. It's really really yeah. good, and it's just it's a very different part of the industry if you're in the industry and you know you're you're thinking of going. I mean, this is where you will meet publishers, you will have more time with them. I think at this show than at many others. Like at Gen Con, maybe you get 15 minutes with someone unless you're a big name, and here you can. I don't know, you will have more time, I would think. Absolutely. At least it's calmer. Thank you guys for going to Nuremberg and recording all those videos. I think we recorded about 100 or so. Is that correct, Lincoln? More, yeah, more than 100, maybe 110. So check out the YouTube channel for those videos. They'll be appearing over the next couple of weeks. They are probably already here as you're watching this. So give those a view. I can't believe there's 100 new games coming out. So just mind boggling. Let's move on to Kickstarter news, Eric. There's two new uh, games that have been out of print for a while that are being kickstarted again. Can you talk about those? Yes, it's interesting just to see sort of things, how, how Kickstarter is used by different publishers. So Finca is being brought back in a new edition. It was originally released by Hansom Gluck and then disappeared from the market, selling for ridiculous amounts of money. And now German publisher Franjos is publishing a new edition, which is exactly the same. They're even using the same mold for the wooden fruit. So, or the same choppers or whatever the, the technical term is. You'll have wooden fruits again in Finca. So if, if the game is new to you, which it probably is, then you can go look at it and find out more. And then Endeavor, which came out in 2009, same year as Finca, is coming back in a new edition as well. And that one's being rejazzed, new art, new pieces, little extra stuff, and that's sort of getting more of the Kickstarter treatment. And again, uh, out of print game that that's, brings a lots of money on the secondary market now being put back on the market again, which will be new for most people. And it's, it's interesting to see that come back, that Kickstarter can do that this, to say, this game was gone before, do you want to see it again? Hey, apparently you do. So, so everything old is new again. That's what's great about the hobby. Even the older games that are to print, they most likely will come back around if they're good. Most likely. Yeah, most of the time. Sometimes you have issues with rights and the designer's no longer around. But for the most part, the older games that are good do come back. You only have to wait 10 years. And it'll be for a new market. Anything on the BGG news front? Yes, there's tons of BGG news. I'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. First off, Games Workshop has worked with us to turn back on file submissions. We work together with their community manager. And if you've been around for a while on BGG, remember that we disabled those file uploads back in the day for various reasons. And now Games Workshop has agreed to work with us to operate within the DMCA to notify us of any copyright issues that may have may come up in the new file uploads. So if you have player aids or one of the, you know, for one of the Games Workshop games, please uh, feel free to upload it now um, as those file submissions have been opened again. Cool. We have also launched the Golden Geek Awards for 2017. So all the games that came out in 2017 are now el eligible for nomination. But by the time you watch this, the games will have been chosen, the nominations will have been closed, and the voting will now start. So go vote for the games that you love in 2017. If you're a site supporter or if you pay a one-time nominal geek gold fee, you can join in the fun and vote for your favorite games from 2017. How long does the nomination period last? 
So the nominations open on February 12th, 2018, and they last for 10 days. Um, so by the time this episode airs, the nominations will be closed. However, voting is now opened, as I mentioned, and you can go vote for those games you liked best from 2018. We appreciate everybody that takes the time to take part in this award of the people, uh, the Golden Gate Golden Geek Awards, where you get to decide what the best games of the year were. We can have endless debates over whether it's going to be an all Gloomhaven Award or Charterstone. Or will it be Seventh Continent? Anyway, some fabulous games this year, and thank you everybody for voting and supporting the award. Seventh Continent again. Moving on to BGGCon news, the premium tickets have already been offered to last year's premium ticket holders, and any remaining tickets will be available for purchase February 26, assuming there are any left over. Also, regular BGGCon tickets will go on sale March 5th around 3 p.m. Central Time. So check the front page of BGG for info about those tickets. Um, and I can't believe we're already t- talking about BGGCon again. Time sure does fly. Also, BGG Spring tickets are still available. So if you want to join us over Memorial Day weekend in Dallas and play the full library of games that they're going to be available. And also all of the Spiel des Jahres nominations will be there again this year with the judges on hand to teach those games to you. Pay attention on the 5th because they sold out very quickly last year and they're likely to do the same again this year. Right. We sold out the tickets in one hour last year and I predict that will happen again. However, if you aren't able to get the ticket at that time, make sure to get on the right waiting list right away so that if the tickets become available, you can... You can pick up a ticket. Last year, anybody on the waiting list was available, was able to get a ticket. Lots of people buy tickets and then plans change or they're not sure they can come or things, things happen. So you will want to see you there. Right. We're going to wrap up the show with a conversation Nikki and I had with friends of the show, Annie and Sebastian, about their gaming in Germany. So thank you, everybody, for watching this week's episode of the Board Game Geek Show. We appreciate all the feedback, comments, and thumbs up and tweets and posts on Board Game Geek. And thank you, Eric and Lincoln, for joining me again on this week's show. Great to be here. Thanks, Scott. Bye. We're checking in with our friends Annie and Sebastian about what's going on in Germany with gaming for them. Hi. Hi. What have you guys been up to? Yeah, we uh, did a tournament with 40K last weekend, and we had about 12 people. 12 people. 12 people playing with us, three games, each of uh, two and a half hours, so a complete long day. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, and you play her uh, uh, Necrons? Necrons, yeah. Her pink Necrons? Yeah. Pur- pink, purple Necrons? Pink and purple. <laughs> and uh, I played my Death Watch the third time, mm-hmm. but uh, it uh, doesn't work that good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of fun, yeah. we laugh a lot, and uh, it yeah. was a great time, we had a great time. Cool. And we try our uh, old games, we have uh, played uh, La Cita, Flashpoint, and um, we have played the, the Mind. Through the Desert. Through the Desert, yes. What did you guys think of Through the Desert? Oh, it's a very neat game. Uh, as we open it and all those little uh, camels showed up, it's, it's super cool. I immediately thought we have to play it. It's just, it's just gorgeous, the, all the little tiny pieces and all the stuff looks very nice. And yeah, we played it and it was a lot of fun. Very, very simple, basic rules, but... Do you have only three pages? Yeah, but you have a really, um, a really deep gameplay into it, so it... Uh... So it held up for you guys? You feel it's, a, it's still a really good game? That's great. You know, that it's, it was one of our top ones. Yeah, it's, it's a really good game. Yeah. 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 Even, even if it's old, but it's, it's, not, it's not an old game. It's, it's still like an... Timeless. Yeah, could be like an evergreen for us. So that's really cool. Yeah. Absolutely. It's still in print. Yeah, they're using they're using the same plastic camels. They'd be foolish to get rid of those. They're so gorgeous. Did what did you guys how did the mine go for you guys? We actually played we don't have the game yet, but we played it with our copy of the game. And it was Dave and Nikki and Rusty and I playing. And oh boy. Um <laughs> So it was not as smooth as when you and Sebastian and Eric and I played in uh, Nuremberg, but uh, it's still a really fun game. Yeah, it's it's really fun. We played it with uh, three players, with a friend of us, Kai, and um, it was just it was just hilarious. <laughs> it's so cool. We we told him the the rules of the game, and he said that that's not a it's not impossible. It's impossible to. Yeah, that's not a game. <laughs> <what's> <laughs> <it>? <laughs> yes. but, but we had a lot of fun, and it works. It totally works. 
Kai had the uh, hundred and I had the uh, ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. I was. Oh, I, <laughs> I had all absolute of, silence. Yeah, <laughs> I played my cards and I sit there. I sat there for ten minutes or something like that. And both of them are like, oh. <laughs> but it works. Yeah, but it worked. <laughs> so it was <laughs> hilarious. I was but laughing all the time. It, that's and great. Both of them were just silently <laughs> staring at each other like. Mm. <laughs> <It> was great. <laughs> Did you guys uh, win any of the games? In the How far, far three, did we come? Three player game we was at level, on level six. six. And you have to play ten, I, I think, with three players, ten? It's, uh, it's, it's eight for four and ten for three and twelve for two. Yeah, we, we have to try two. I don't know if this works. Maybe it works with us. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> we have to try it, yeah. Well, that's, that's the know. thing is figuring out. Nikki was, she was playing with these uh, little, we were using these as counters for lives and shurikens. Yeah. And um, they, uh, she kept playing with them like, you got to focus, Nikki. <laughs> uh, but it was really great. Rusty particularly just, he was agonizing over his plays. I'm like, Rusty, three point, three numbers away. You just yeah. play it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was awesome. It's, uh, we, we, Nikki said we finally found a card game that Rusty's not good at. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird how 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 minds are different for for all those. Yeah, it's a special is, genre. Yeah, is this card near or is it near enough or not or whatever? So it's it's weird, but it's so fun. It's instinct. Yes, and tiny. And it's uh, I I liked how how Eric uh, was teaching us the game. It's just like oh here are your card and now we have to play it in this order. <laughs> Do it. And I was just like, what? Okay. Okay. <laughs> and it worked, so. Well, considering when we played, we thought we had to play 12 rounds with the, uh, with the four of us, but we only had to do eight. So we were actually close to winning. It was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, we, we came was pretty, very close, pretty yes. far, yeah. Well, guys, thanks for joining us. We'll have to have you back again soon. Maybe you can have some word from the street on what's going on with the SDJ nominees. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having us, and we will keep our eyes open. <laughs> well, cool. Talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.